Uh, buenos dias uh, a todos. Uh, my, my presentation will be on the the new kilogram and how we how we are getting there and what the potential impacts will be in in the future. <clears throat> so. In 2019, there was a step change in the kilogram definition, which I'm sure you're aware of. So from uh, the definition based on an artifact, the kilogram is the unit of mass equal to the mass of the international prototype kilogram, i.e. the mass of a physical artifact. The definition went to one relating to the Planck constant, so uh, relating to a fundamental constant of physics. Um, and this gives the benefit of ultimate stability. So uh, while we know that an artifact based um, kilogram, whether it be a, a, a brass weight, a cast iron weight or a stainless steel weight, a platinum weight are all intrinsically unstable, even the international prototype, a definition based on the Planck constant is, is ultimately perfectly stable. Um, talking about artifact based definitions, this is um, the kind of stability you can expect from a primary kilogram. So from the uh, international prototype kilogram or from, in this case, the UK national standard, a kilogram of plasma iridium like the IPK. So you can see <clears throat> uh, the big issue is that the kilograms get dirty. Um, if they're cleaned, then you can get back to a value which is plus or minus approximately 10 micrograms from a reference value. But in between these cleanings, the kilograms get dirty at a predictable rate, but not a constant rate. So um, it's very difficult to use it as, a, as an ultimate primary standard. And this was the reason for looking for a new definition. So what do the new definitions look like? Um, the first definition, there are two different definitions, which is nice because if we get the same number from two definitions, we can have great confidence in its value. So the first definition is the X-ray crystal density or Avogadro experiment. Um, and this is uses a sphere of pure single crystal silicon. And we measure the volume, the lattice spacing. That's how far the atoms are apart and the isotopic composition. What sort of atoms of silicon we have? Silicon has three different isotopes, so we need to know which isotopes we have. Um, and this definition is traceable to the Avogadro constant, but the Avogadro constant, the Planck constant are very, very closely linked at a fundamental level. So having made these measurements of volume, lattice spacing and isotopic composition, we work out how many atoms we've got and therefore what the, the weight of the spherical artifact will be. Things to note with this is, although we can measure the isotopes, we can't measure them very accurately. So we need to use enriched silicon 28, which is very expensive. Although traceability is to a fundamental constant, the end product is still an artifact. So we're still, still in a way stuck with an artifact as our kilogram, albeit one which is more fundamentally traceable. And this can be scaled, but optimal accuracy for this experiment can only really be realized at, at the one kilogram level. Um, the other way that the, the kilogram is, is um, defined or realized is, is via the, the Kibble balance experiment. This gives you an electrical kilogram. So kilogram force is generated by current passing through a coil suspended in a magnetic field. That's the weighing phase. Um, field strength B and L are very, very difficult to measure. Um, so they are calibrated during a moving phase where we move the coil through the magnetic field and generate a voltage which we can measure very accurately. And the kilogram produced is measured in terms of voltage, resistance, velocity or displacement and local gravity. We're generating a, a force, so we need to convert it to a mass, so we need to know what local gravity is very accurately. The things to note with this experiment are um, there are kibble balances all around the world at various NMIs, probably about seven or eight working at a, a, a level of uh, a part in 10 to the 8 the, or part in 10 to 7 or better at the moment. That's equivalent to 100 micrograms on, on one kilogram. And kibble balances are currently expensive and complicated, mainly due to the need for quantum electrical standards. So I spoke about voltage and resistance measurements. These are made with quantum standards which need to be used at, at cryogenic temperatures. So these are, are expensive bits of kit at the moment. A good thing about the Kibble balance is it can be scaled so we can make a very small one to measure a few milligrams or even below up to maybe a few kilograms if we can generate enough power to, 
to generate the force necessary. OK, that's the quick look at the uh, the Kibble balance and the Avogadro experiments. Richard Green will be talking next on the Kibble balance and give you much more detail on, on that experiment. Um, at the moment, we're using a consensus value for the kilogram because the experiments on these primary realizations around the world don't agree to a level where we're confident that they can be relied on, relied on to disseminate their own their own mass scales. So these are the steps from using the IPK to using individual realization experiments to develop to, to realize kilograms at, at a national level. So initially we had dissemination from the IPK, which I talked about the definition relating to an artifact. This finished in, in 2019, where we went on to um, a definition in terms of the Planck constant, but dissemination from the artifact with an increased uncertainty. The stage we're at at the moment is we're using a consensus value for the kilogram, and the consensus value comes from a weighted mean of all the experiments around the world to give us the best estimate of a kilogram we can get at the moment. And finally, we'll go on to uh, a phase where these individual experiments can disseminate their own kilograms or their own versions of the mass scale. And this will happen when we reach uh, certain certain criteria. So essentially when all the experiments agree. And the consensus value kind of looks like this. So we have um, realizations all around the world. They send their values via artifacts to the BIPM and the BIPM coordinates them all and comes up with a consensus value for the kilogram and disseminates this consensus value. And that way we can ensure that we have a consistent scale for mass all around the world. Um, I talked about going from the consensus value to the individual realizations being responsible for the national kilograms around the world. Um, and there are five um, uh, OK, there are uh, four criteria that we need in place for that to happen. And I think probably four of the, or three of the four are in place. The only one that's not in place is that there is being consistent results between the, the individual experiments. So I think probably phase B is or phase B is or condition B is the one that is not being being realized at the moment. Um, here you can see the results of the last published key comparison and the uh, the reason we haven't got um, a consensus, uh, a, a, a method to, to move to phase three where we can use the individual experiments is because of the values from NRC in Canada and PTB. These are the best two values that are being produced at the moment and they're not in very good agreement. So if we start disseminating from individual experiments, we run the risk of introducing a, a change or a step in the mass scale between these experiments. So this is why we're using a consensus value at the moment. And when these values converge from NRC and PTB and any other of the, of the, 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 uh, the NMIs with these experiments, then we'll be in a position to allow individual experiments to realise what we know will be the same kilogram rather than slightly different kilograms. So here, demonstrating consistency with the key comparison reference value is really the, the sticking point that we have at the moment because of mainly the values from NRC and PTB, mainly PTB being the German laboratory, mainly because they have such low uncertainties compared with all the others, but they have the, the sort of uncertainties that the other labs are, are targeting. So I want to talk a little bit about Kibble balance and what the current state of the art is. Um, NRC, as you'll hear um, next, have the, the best balance in the world and it's working at about 11 parts in 10 to the 9. That's 11 micrograms on a kilogram and to put it into context, that's really all we need to maintain the mass scale at the level it was maintained uh, prior to the redefinition and the level which supports all industrial needs around the world. Uh, there are six additional experiments at other NMIs working at 20 to 50 parts in 10 to 9 level. So getting towards the level we need for, for primary experiments. Um, all these balances started development before the redefinition of the kilogram and therefore their their rationale, their, their idea was to, to measure the Planck constant. Um, and for that reason, they're very, they're very um, complicated experiments and the current cost of developing this type of type of experiment is you know, 1 million euros and 10 years um, in development. And that's actually quite optimistic, um, quite optimistic numbers. 
MPL in UK, uh, where I work, is developing a, what we call a next generation NMI level cable balance, where we're trying to simplify the whole thing to make it much more cost effective and much more easier to, to use as well. Um, NIST and American PTB have reduced tabletop balances, which demonstrate the application of the principles to more commercial apparatus. Um, this slide is really just to give you um, a perspective on how complicated the various kibble balances are at, at, at the moment and the fact you can see they're distributed all around the world. So we have America, France, um, BIPM being an international lab, Canada, um, Sweden and uh, sorry, Switzerland, um, Korea and, and uh, China. So you know, a lot of NMIs around the world have, have these balances already, but they're all very difficult to use. Um, also a problem with the kibble balance, you need external, stand, uh, external standards. So to measure voltage resistance, distance, time and gravity, we need what's called the Josephson voltage standard. This is a like a very, very complicated battery. It gives a very stable um, one volt or 10 volt uh, voltage standard. Um, but you can see it's a very complicated piece of equipment. And one of the big issues is it needs to run cryogenically at, at near, near zero Kelvin temperatures. So we need an awful lot of liquid helium to, to, to actually run these experiments. The same with the quantum hall resistor. You can see there's a dual with this as well. It needs liquid helium to run it. Um, and it's again a very complicated resistor. Um, the displacement or velocity measurements need to be done with an interferometer. This is not so much of a problem because this is a, a fairly basic piece of equipment which is relatively cheap, but also complicates the apparatus because you need to find a way of installing it in essentially in a mass balance. And you need to measure gravity to convert the forces measured by the kibble balance to, to masses, which is essentially what we need to, to generate. Um, so looking forward, this is what we're working with at the moment, but the technology has a lot of scope to, to improve, not only improve at the National Mass Measurement Institute level, but also improve where it can actually be simplified and used in industry. So looking at traceability at the moment, the traceability chain is, is quite complicated. So we're going from BIPM to NMIs to accredited labs to end users. And ultimately the, the aim would be to have kibble type apparatus at the end user level. So all this traceability chain could be done away with and, and the, 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 the end users, yourselves, industry, um, calibration labs, scientific research labs can have direct traceability to the SI without the need for all these links in the, the traceability chain. And at each link, we're losing uncertainty, but at each link, it, it can go catastrophically wrong as well. It only takes one of these labs to, to make an error in one of their calibrations and the whole chain uh, disintegrates. So um, primary traceability at the shop for all level is, is a, an ultimate aim, which, which has a lot of benefits. Um, this graph just gives you an idea of um, where the, the relative uncertainties are, are high and low. So at the kilogram, looking at the red line, the relative uncertainties are, 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 high, are very low. So at a kilogram down to 100 grams, up to 10 kilograms, it's relatively easy to realise the mass scale. But if you look to the right of the, the graph, as we go down, the uncertainties become very, very high. So at the milligram level, we're talking about 1%, maybe 0.1% if we're lucky, uncertainties. And if you're working with pharmaceuticals, for example, where you're measuring milligrams or sub milligrams, then these uncertainties are very significant. So if we can get direct traceability down at that level rather than having to disseminate, our relative uncertainties become much smaller and we can develop things like personalised medicines, uh, personalised medical devices, things like that, to much, much more reliable um, ends. So looking at how the dissemination might change. So this is what we've got at the moment. Um, the IPK goes to national standard kilograms, goes to calibrated weights at national labs and then at calibration labs. And then to all these applications at the end. So anything from thousands of tons weighing ships and um, hundreds of kilograms, um, grams and kilograms for, for trade purposes, down to milligrams and sub milligrams for, for example, pharmaceuticals. And from direct traceability to the SI and using these next generation kibble balances, we can, we can do away with the necessity for this long, complicated traceability chain and give direct traceability to most of these applications. Direct traceability for hundreds of kilograms and, and tons 
and thousands of tons will be very difficult with the kibble technology, but traceability to for milligrams will be much easier with kibble technology than it is currently with small weights and long traceability chains back to the, the, uh, the consensus value for the kilogram which we're using at the moment. So looking at end user kibble plank and jaw balances, um, these can provide direct SI traceability for mass force and indeed torque measurements for end users at the point of need. Um, but what we need to improve on is current technology by providing better accuracy um, and they will be better, more reliable than the current technology as well. So we can use them in harsh environments. Um, they can be probably used for dynamic measurements, whereas if you think about measuring on mass balances, they're not really suitable for, for dynamic measurements. And the problem at the moment is the high cost of the current technologies, the interferometers, the Josephson and voltage source, the quantum hall resistance and so forth. So these are the things we need to address to get kibble balances which can be used at the, the end user level. Um, so this is just a, a, just to reiterate why, why scaling a kibble balance is so, so um, useful in, in terms of disseminating the mass scale. Um, as you see, going from the uh, kilogram downwards um, to much smaller masses, going from right to left on the graph, the, the uncertainty increases and you also get to a point at about the milligram level where the weights become so small they're in, impractical to use. So the kibble balance has the, the uh, technology to improve the uncertainties at the lower level and also to extend the sort of measurements we can make to micro mass and micro force measurements. So what do micro kibble balances look like? Um, I mean, most of them are, are conceptual at the moment but it, it's essentially scaling the kibble technology, which we've we've looked at briefly and which Richard will talk about a bit in, in more detail later on, essentially scaling it down to a micro level where we can produce it on a MEMS device, so a, um, a MEMS device or a micro mechanical device um, where it can be produced hopefully very cheaply and embedded in, in manufacturing processes and also used to measure very small masses and forces. So it has the potential to improve the accuracy of process control, um, minimise downtime, um, make transferable mass standards or any other calibration artefacts redundant so we don't have these small mass standards which are inherently unstable because they're so small and also very easy to lose. And uh, they're traceable and reproducible. So, um, so the, the, the other thing, as I said, that they can do is they can measure time varying masses. So um, if we have a dynamic uh, mass requirement, for example, in a production process, the micro kibble balances or indeed the macroscopic kibble balances are much better at doing this than, than current balance technology. OK, thank you. Um, so what sort of applications are there for these micro kibble balances? Um, all, all of these um, pharmaceutical research where they're developing new drugs and the active ingredients uh, often at the sub milligram level. So the more accurately you can measure these active ingredients, the more accurate your clinical trials will be. And again, this can lead on to personalised medicine where everyone gets exactly the right dosage in, in the medicine they're taking. Gene and cell therapy where, where you're dealing with very, very small quantities, micrograms and milligrams. And these are high value powders, so the more accurately you can measure them, the more effective you can do the research and the more cost effective you can do the production. Um, air pollution. So there is a way that the kibble balance technology can be applied to um, measure and monitoring air pollution. At the moment, the gold standard for measuring air pollution is to use a piece of filter paper, which you leave in an environment for a day. You take it in and you weigh it. Um, with a kibble balance, you can make almost real time measurements um, in that environment. So you can you don't have to aggregate them over a day. You can aggregate them over a few minutes and you don't run the risk of, of making errors as you transfer your, your filter paper back to your lab to, to make your measurements. Um, AFMs and nano indenters measuring very small forces. Kibble balance gives you traceable way back to the SI to, to make these measurements. Diamonds and precious metals where um, the, the, the intrinsic value is high. Accuracy is important. The kibble balance can improve that. And in microfabrication and, and robotics. So whereabouts are we in terms of applying this technology? Um, thanks to the guys at NIST for providing these slides. That's the current NIST kibble balance, which they're using to realise there or to produce the kilogram to contribute to the, the consensus value. 
um, but they also have this electrostatic force balance, which measures forces or masses of the range of a milligram or so to an uncertainty of part in 10 to the, the six, which is sort of two orders of magnitude improvement over what's available at the moment. So this, although the, the, the apparatus is quite complicated at the moment, you can see where the benefits are for people needing to measure small forces and small masses. Um, so the limitation here is that the, the last point, they require large facility level infrastructure. So they um, normally require very high, very, very high actually voltage sources, resistance standards, capacitance standards. So the, the real next step will be to simplify the mechanics of these devices, but also to make these voltage resistance and, and velocity displacement standards much more simple and cheap. Um, looking at tabletop balances for uh, macroscopic mass, um, PTB, uh, sorry, there's, there's this uh, photonic force balance, which um, NIST have also developed designed to measure laser power from photon uh, momentum. So this is even, even smaller forces, but this gives traceability where no real traceability has existed to the SI in terms of force measurement before. So this advances the state of the art. Um, NIST also have this um, uh, GIBG1 balance, which is a tabletop instrument for measuring um, tens and hundreds of grams. So this is sort of the next step towards what will become an, an end user device. And um, more, well, maybe more ambitiously, there's this quantum electromechanical metrology suite, which is NMI level instrument for the kilogram to realize the kilogram, but also for the voltage and resistance standards that I've spoken about. So these are all things that NIST are working on, and, and thanks to Leon and, and the guys at NIST for providing this information. Um, looking at other experiments, METAS in, in Switzerland uh, have worked on a microforce balance for specific customers in, 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 in Switzerland, and they worked in collaboration with Mela Toledo, who are a well-known balance manufacturer. As you know, PTB are working on what they call a plank balance, which is essentially a, a kibble balance, which is destined to, or they, they think will replace um, laboratory level balances. So your, your kind of 200 gram, one kilogram balance with, with, with 10 or 100 microgram resolution. PCB will, are working on something that will replace those and work on the kibble balance principles. NMIJ in Japan are working on, on a low force balance. Um, but you can again see from these experiments, they're still quite complicated bits of equipment. Um, again, from this, this is really interesting because not only can you measure mass with a kibble balance, you can measure force, of course, but you can also measure torque because you can generate a rotational force rather than a, a, a linear force. So NIST have this um, electronic uh, torque realizer. So essentially it's a kibble balance principles to produce um, a, a torque which can be used to calibrate um, torque transducers, torque, torque wrenches, um, and, and primary torque standards as well. Um, the problem with torque at the moment is you're relying on, on a length measurement and a mass measurement, both of which are relatively simple, but you're also relying on a mechanical apparatus to, to multiply the length by the mass. And that you don't really know how well that's working. So this gives you a direct torque, directly traceable to a kibble balance principle. So this is a, a step forward in terms of reliability of, of torque measurement. Um, MPL is working on a, a next generation kibble balance, which will be a low cost NMI level balance. So meant for, for use at NMI, but much simplified, um, capable of, of realizing the, the SI. Um, it's designed to be scalable, but what we've worked out is that 200 grams is probably the optimum point to, to, to use it. That, because of the redefinition of the kilogram and the ref, revision of the SI, you no longer we need to realize a kilogram. The definition of the kilogram doesn't have the kilogram stated in it. It just has a value for the Planck constant. So we can realize the mass scale anywhere we like. And we think the optimum is about 200 grams because to scale up from 200 grams to kilogram is, is very straightforward. You just need five 200 gram weights essentially. Um, this is uh, <clears throat> another interesting piece of uh, research that we did with it in Metro in Brazil looking at a radiation force balance based on the kibble balance principles. Um, so current state of the art for radiation force balance is about plus or minus 5%. So this has the potential to, to, to greatly improve on that. They, and in Metro produced a kibble balance apparatus based on parts produced by additive manufacturing. 
to provide traceability for ultrasound measurements. So this is essentially the, the proof of concept that a Kibble balance can be used to, to, uh, to calibrate radiation forces. Um, the apparatus developed used a two, conventional two pound balance, but in, in future this could also be worked by producing uh, a self-contained um, uh, ultrasound power meter which works on Kibble balance principles. Um, Right, so just to reiterate, I, I spoke about the, the stepping stones that we need to, to get to these end user devices. And one is a simplification of the mechanical designs, which is happening iteratively all the time. The other is uh, a simplification or a, a, a more cost efficient way to generate these external standards. So voltage resistance, length or displacement and velocity and, and gravity. Um, so what we have at the moment, um, our, our kind of Zener um, voltage standards which work at, at room temperature at about the part in 10 to 7 level, which is mm, good enough for some applications, but not for all. Um, resistance, we can we can improve on by improving temperature control and reducing the thermal coefficient of, of, of resistors. Uh, we can use LVDTs um, instead of lasers potentially um, at parts in 10 to 7 level. Um, and gravity, really, the only way to measure gravity at the level we need is using this commercial FG5 device. But people are looking at quantum gravimeters, which is a, a simplified way of measuring um, gravity and particularly changes in gravity. So there is work going ahead to simplify the way gravity, gravity can be measured as well. So I think looking at this, the real sticking point is going to be the voltage standards. There are, there is, as far as I know, no work to simplify the voltage standards from the Josephson voltage source, which is a cryogenic device and a very complicated um, piece of apparatus. So that uh, essentially is the sticking point at the moment. So in, in, in summary, um, the nuclear RAM definition presents opportunities to improve the way the SI mass scale um, uh, is, is um, realized and, and disseminated. Um, cool balances are currently mechanically complicated and need high end external measurement capability. So for these voltage and resistance measurements. Next generation balances are being developed and will make technology much more accessible to NMIs and improve the robustness of the global measurement scale. And the next, there is an opportunity to improve torque, and micro torque measurement as well. And further ahead, Kibble balance technology can be developed as an end user device for use in harsh environments, for use in dynamic measurement, and then more widely on the shop floor. The main unfulfilled requirement for end user Kibble balances is a stable and accurate room temperature voltage standards, as I discussed. Okay, thank you very much for your attention.